My dad lived a fuller, richer life than most people who don't have half the health problems he had. He didn't talk much about those problems, at least not while I was growing up. When he did, it was usually to make a joke about his fingers or his eye, and I keep an eye on that for you. <laughs> it's not that he didn't like to talk. On the contrary, I remember him being very social and talking a lot with visiting friends or relatives, but he wasn't much for having uncomfortable or awkward discussions or talking about his feelings. Dad's love language was gift giving. And when I was younger, he was way more likely to give you a couple bucks or a new tool, probably from Harbor Freight, <laughs> than to openly express any emotion he felt. And that's just what he did when he dropped me off at college. He asked whether I needed any money and he gave me a couple of bucks. At the time, I didn't realize that it was his way of saying, I love you. I remember one other gift giving instead of awkward discussion occasion when I was in my early teens. He came in one afternoon while I was sitting at the kitchen table doing homework and for no reason gave me a gift box of Old Spice. <laughs> at the time, I thought it was completely random, but now that I'm older and I have a 14-year-old boy of my own, <laughs> I imagine my mom probably complained about his son smelling like a teenage boy and insisted he talk about hygiene with me. But rather than have the awkward conversation, he thought he'd just fix it with some cologne. <laughs> That's my dad, Creative Solutions. I think things changed for dad as he got older. In the last few years, he said, I love you a lot more. He told me several times recently how proud he was of me. I didn't get to express to him nearly enough how proud I've always been of him and how grateful I am for how much he taught me. My dad taught me what it means to be a man. You own up to your mistakes, you follow through on your responsibilities and your commitments, you provide for your family, and you take care of your tools. <laughs> you stand up to shake hands and you keep your shirt buttons, your tie and your belt buckle in a straight line. My dad taught me self-sufficiency. He was a die-hard do-it-yourselfer who was committed to completing that remodeling project, fixing that car or solving that home problem on his own and on a budget. It was a self-sufficiency tempered by knowledge of his limitations, though. He wasn't above asking a buddy for help when he might be getting it over his head, although that may have been for social reasons. He taught me the value of hard work. When looking for a job in the years following his war injury, Dad was told he was too weak to be a hospital orderly, that he would be unemployable, but he wouldn't accept that. He kept looking for work, found it, and impressed everyone with what he was capable of. Dad dreamed even back then of owning his own business, maybe a small engine repair shop, and setting up a workshop in the back of the garage, a dream he would realize years later when he established P&J Upholstery. He taught me never to replace what you can repair. He taught me to take pride in your home, your appearance, and your accomplishments. My dad taught me that a car can do two things, stop and go. And if it can't do the first thing, you better not do the second thing. <laughs> my dad taught me to respect other people, especially my mother. I think the first time I remember being afraid for my own life was when he came to talk with teenage me after I shouted at my mom in anger. When he told me in no uncertain terms that I would never talk to like her like that again. He put the literal fear of God into me. <laughs> Dad really loved Mom and was fiercely protective of her up until the very end. Roy, he told me recently, that is one smart lady. <laughs> I inherited my dad's sense of humor. And he taught me to dance like nobody's watching, but only when people are watching. <laughs> and then only when it's going to be most embarrassing for your kids. <laughs> My dad taught me that just because someone says you can't do something doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Like, you're unemployable. Like, you can't do carpentry if you're missing one eye. Like, you can't actually see a 3D movie if you're missing an eye. 
that's actually true. <laughs> Remember magic eye posters back in the 90s, the ones you had to stare at to see the hidden 3D image? You literally need two eyes to make them work, but you couldn't tell him that. He would stare intently at those things, convinced he was actually going to be able to see the hidden image. There was one area, though, where he admitted defeat. My dad couldn't cook. <laughs> I remember one dinner, goulash, I think it was, when we were very young. That was an absolute disaster. And that may have been the very last time he ever actually tried, but watching him made me want to learn and to be better. So I want to thank my old man for his horrible kitchen skills, but in all seriousness, I want to thank him for the example he always set, always learning, always wanting to be better. My dad was a high school dropout who suffered a life-altering disability in the war before he was even old enough to vote and was subsequently told he was unemployable. That dropout couldn't get enough, but instead he sought to improve himself even as he improved our home. Dad always had a project he was working on, and sometimes that project was himself. Finding a job with Heiser Ford, then becoming manager of the parts department, graduating from trade school, starting his own business, advancing as a member of the Masons. Dad was always moving forward, except for when he couldn't. Dad's bad health days are hardest for me to look back on. When I was younger, I didn't understand how difficult it was for him. And now that I do, I look back with sympathy and wonder how he managed to do anything at all. But I also look back with regret over how I felt toward him at the time, wishing I could have understood and been more compassionate back then. There are visible and invisible wounds, and my father had both. He told me not a day went by when he was reminded of Vietnam just by looking at his hands. It went farther than that, though. I know that the memories of the war were a deep, inseparable part of him. And I can recall several occasions when sights or sounds would trigger a memory tangible enough to take him right back there. Through my dad, I learned that memory is powerful and precious. Make memories, keep them, cherish them. Memories make us who we are, even as we remember who and what the people in our lives were. We will have good and bad recollections of everyone. Look back on the good memories with gratitude and look back on the bad memories with grace. Don't try to forget the bad stuff. Keep those memories as a reminder that each one of us is human with frailties and failures that balance our strengths and successes. Know also looking back that the grace we extend to others will be measured out to us in quantities greater than we can deserve by a God larger than we can imagine. I believe dad understood that grace and embraced it. While he was never much of a church goer, toward the end, dad let us know where he stood on matters of faith. Jesus is my friend, he said, emphasizing to us how important it is to walk with him and talk with him. That Jesus could reach the heart of a man so strongly independent and so wounded by life, bringing peace and redemption is amazing grace. I believe dad's eternity, an eternity in a glorified body free from pain was secured by his faith in Jesus. And I believe eternal security is available to each of us through that same belief and faith. Meanwhile, we mourn, but not as those without hope, because if we embrace the redemption that is offered, we will see Pat again in his glorified body and rejoice together. 
it's a miracle that dad lived as well as he did for as long as he did. However, before you imagine his injuries, his disabilities, somehow robbed him of something, let me tell you what he gained when that injury changed the course of his life. Six children, 15 grandchildren, loving and supportive in-laws with nieces and nephews who have helped fill his life with immeasurable joy. And an amazing, remarkable woman to call his wife, who is the living personification of Psalm 31. Proverbs 31. That's grace. That's mercy. And that's miraculous. By all rights, by all rights, Patrick Leroy Smalley should have died in Vietnam on February 3rd, 1967. His life was a miracle. And that makes our whole family a miracle. Each and every one of us. When his life should have ended, God had other plans. And that means God has plans for you, my brothers and sisters, my nieces and nephews, my children. If Pat had been lost, none of us would be here. He recognized that gift. Maybe not right away, but when he did, he did not squander it. We also cannot take lightly the gift, the miracle that has been passed on to us through our father and our papa. Do not squander it. Honor Pat, honor his life by living as he did. Responsible and devoted, respectful, proud and self-sufficient, yet humble enough to ask a friend for help. A hard worker, a jokester, a lifelong learner, an overcomer. Thank <laughs> you.